All right. A little twitch. How you doing? Happy, I don't know, what is it? I'm gonna take a streamer streamer voice right now. Happy Friday, everybody. Hope you're doing well. We've got Chris and Ishmael here, right? Hope I said that. Well, we are playing Never Alone here. Um, Ishmael, I'm sure you'll be able to deliver this justice of what the game is about more than I will. <laughs> if you want to explain uh, Never Alone and the Foxtail DLC, which is specifically what we will be playing today. Yeah, yeah. My, my name is Ongoluk, my new pet name. And I'm also uh, Clinkit from my father's side and Nupak from my mother's side. And Never Alone Kisima Ingetuna. In Nupak, that means I'm not alone. We, look, we, look, we got that translation from the late Fanny Akpik. And we wanted to do uh, Upper One Games with Cook Inlet Tribal Council in um, Anchorage, Anchorage, Alaska. Wanted to do a game, I uh, wanted to create a video game. They, they wanted to um, show the rich culture of Alaska. And so they partnered with Eli and Media. And that is a company in Seattle. And I work most directly with Sean Vesey, uh, creative director and we we just we had the the directive make a game you know and uh cook and Litz wanted to make an a new back game that's the people of the circumpolar north and so we just it was a lot of trial and error you know even the the form side scrolling you know um Kind of kind of game that, that that took you know we we took some time to you know a puzzle platformer you know like um mario brothers you know that that's it's a lot of these the i had to get a lot of education myself in learning about that but it made sense to me because surviving up in the north you have to get through things you know and and there's also the land. You're always figuring out the land. And so we, we had so many conversations about the culture and how that can fit within, and, and the great, great, beautiful storytelling tradition can fit within a, you know, a, a video game. And so we, we wanted to build those mechanics, you know, with these puzzles into that, that beautiful, rich literature that mythology and that knowledge of the land and of the animals and um, perceptions of the world so never alone was built from that and so you have these um two main characters uh, nuna and her friend the fox and the first game was was based on a story by robert cleveland you know it's it's more of a longer a little bit longer than fox tales and with the second game it's actually more like a sequel as uh, it's like under the never alone umbrella but it's its own it was designed to be its own game um, as a sequel to never alone and so there's just a little bit less gameplay but it's its own it's really its own thing in in so many ways so we worked with the story of the two coastal brothers by my, my grandfather, um, Willie Goodwin Sr., Hunnick. And then um, he had passed away in the 70s of a, of a, you know, uh, of a drowning accident. And so I had never known him, but my mom had always told um, me about him and, and how she, he cared for the family and how he was so, he almost like spoiled her because he wanted to do everything for her. Um, but uh, really taught, you know, the whole family so much about how to live in the Arctic. And we translated those two coastal brothers to Nuna and the Fox. And so this is, this is a game in a lot of ways that just, that explores that, that structure of the story. And then with those, so many of those concepts about using mechanics to ha have them work within 
a construct of the new back world. Um, and I, I believe the storytellers are the greatest storytellers in human history. I study literature. I listen to audiobooks of Homer's The Odyssey and the Iliad and Paradise Lost by John Milton and Dante's The, the Divine Comedy. And, you know, um, I read it, read it a lot, but now I'm listening more to the audiobooks to feel the, the oral literature part of it, to feel it alive in my mind. Um, and I compare the great storytellers to my own elders. You know, um, across Native America, and so that—that's what part part of this is—is is to show. You know, within a game, you can have all, even if you're not even thinking about it. You know, it should be a good, fun game, but within the game, it should have that vitality. You know, where you can, you, you're, you're not like being taught something. You don't feel like you're being taught something, not necessarily, you know, especially if you don't feel like watching the cultural insights videos. Those are documented, short documentaries as almost like little cookies that you can get once you get, you get to certain parts of the game, you can watch. And in Fox Tales, you'd be watching uh, me and my uncles, um, Willie John and Elmer, which is exciting. I, I like my family. So, um, but it's not just about learning um, you, you know, you can just enjoy yourself. But for me, it's the pleasure of your mind expanding. You know, what literature can do is take you outside, take you beyond what you, you think you know and understand. And I, I believe that Alaska Native oral literature, mythology, the stories uh, do that for you. And I wanted to reflect that somehow in this game. So that's my... <laughs> No, thank you. Yeah, the game is very beautiful. I've played through all of the base game um, previously on the Twitch, and we did have a lovely time um, really listening to the narrator, and then wa we watched all the cultural insights as well, so it's really, um, uh, it was really enlightening, you know, like when you play the game, you feel, one, graphically, the game is really held up over time in a way, like we were commenting cool. how um, the fur, particularly, is really good. Like, fur is usually notoriously difficult in video games, but I think it's like some type of the balloon or like uh, just a little bit of fuzziness that you, you do around the fur it makes it welcoming, but also lets it keep the charm. And like, it's a guy, the graphics have a way of like not aging. And that's really, I think, a special thing to do, particularly when you're mixing it with the 2D. Um, paintings that happen during the cutscenes was also a really uh, lovely visual storytelling as well. So really, I really enjoy the game. <laughs> I love that. I love, I want, I had hopes like with everything I create, you know, I'm, I work in multiple genres, mainly as a writer, but just uh, also as an artist, but everything I create, I want it to have a shelf life. I want it to, to have um, meaning and, and richness. To, so just to hear that it holds up like that's that's a great compliment. Mm -hmm. um, so I won't hijack too much of the conversation. Uh, what I'm gonna do first before we get into Fox Tales is that I'm gonna play the the Coastal Brothers uh, cultural insight for the um, for the Twitch chat, and then and then you know you guys will hear it obviously. <laughs> um, Just but a quick note: I look a lot different. <laughs> Um, it's a side I, profile I, versus head on, <laughs> you know. <it's> just <laughs> <laughs> I lost a lot of weight, but I, I, it, it's not just the weight. It's it's that I've aligned my body, and my my body was all out of whack. So was it really? So here, it's it's just it's fun to watch me, you know, from from a while ago. You know, I'm, I'm now stronger and more aligned. So even as you you see me in this video, you might see me, you know, kind of doing these kinds of things. So <laughs> that's part of you know. Uh, tra tra it, it just reminds me of traditional training because, you know, in the Never Alone video game, I, I, in one of those cultural insights, I talk about how you, you work all day. Mm -hmm. you, you get up before the, the sun rises, you know, before dawn, and you go right into work. You don't even, you don't even um, eat. You only eat later on in the day, and that's pretty much all the cultures. And, and so that's, that's the value, 
you know, but being raised in, you know, modern times is more of a sedentary lifestyle. So I, I went through tremendous chronic pain, like really, really horrible experiences since that time where it was just starting, you know, and then, you know, I had to go, I had to survive, but like I used Anupak and Clinkit and indigenous uh, methodologies to get my body back. So it's just interesting to see myself from that time, you know. It's actually really interesting because, you know, our culture is very sedimentary, if that's a word. So, yeah, uh, I don't know, that would be interesting to know more about how, how that process works. Oh, yeah, it's traditional training. Pretty much every culture is like a training lifestyle. Hmm. OK. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to play this uh, just for the chat. In 1964, my uh, grandfather, Appa Willie Goodwin Sr., uh, Punnett, yeah, there's was my invited grandpa. by archaeologists and anthropologists from Brown University. He was invited to the uh, Onion Portage site, this ancient uh, sacred site of the Anupak people. And it was really special for my, my grandfather to be included in that kind of thing because it showed the respect they had for, for his knowledge, for what he had to offer. And while they were there, while they were camped out there, when they had some quiet time, he told some stories. Uh, one of the stories that my grandfather told was the story of the Coastal Brothers. These two brothers, uh, they have their own particular skills. They go out to the Noatak River area, and they go to try to challenge and hopefully defeat this giant mouse who is destroying everything in its path. The development team really took a great interest in the story that my grandfather told because it really um, enhances those themes that we, we found in Never Alone. One of interdependence, another of Anupak values. Um, love of our, our, our elders and of our land and of our traditions. I mean, it helped to really um, bring, the, bring that out. And, and so that's one, one reason why it really captivated the interest of the team. There is the intro to that. Uh, I'm just gonna hit new game on. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna get new game on it, and then we will go from there. I think I have a question. <laughs> no, I don't remember my question. <laughs> it's okay. And then this, it's really nice to hear my, um, my Uncle Willie, uh, who, who's named after my grandpa, oh. um, senior. so it's Uncle Willie Jr. who is the narrator for this, speaking in the Unipak language. And so, in your role, um, did you write the script that that he's narrating, or how did how did that what how did that process work? What are, what what is um, sort of just like oral history gathering, and 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 then what is what is the writing uh, aspect? Well, I think when working with the old stories, it's important to not. I, I, I think there's so much adapted by, you know, you know, a non usually a non native writer, they it's adapted by, you know, you have a lot of children's books, you know, of native stories that were adapted by non native writers. And so we had a lot of that conversation, how do we make this a game that honors actually the original storyteller. So that's why we have these cultural insights that features those original storytellers, Robert, you know, um, my grandpa, really good one, senior, Hunnick uh, in this one. And so it's it's just so important to use as much of the original as possible to work directly with the family where the story comes from. That's why I work so much with my uncles and, and there's myself as a descendant. And, and also use as much of the original 
um, story as possible. And so a lot of what I, what I did, so that's, I, I considered it maybe one of my, um, the best writing challenge is to maintain that, that original vitality and beauty. And yet it's still, you know, you still to make it with the gameplay, make it work within this world. Obviously it's not brothers now, it's uh, a young girl and her fox friend. And it's adding uh, a part of the story which we have a cultural insight on, this part where they, um, in some ways they break a taboo by um, mi unknowingly or, or just making a mistake in mistreating a mouse, you know? Um, playing with it too much, rather than um, just respecting the animal and let them be, you know, and so that causes, you know, the disruption. And there's, there's, you know, mythologically, you could talk about that as sort of the eternal return. They break a taboo, and then they go out in the out-of-body out experience as you know, one of my teachers, Richard Downhauer, would say. And in that out-of-body experience with another, sometimes with another animal tribe, you know, or in this case, going to defeat the monster, the giant rat, then they come back with new knowledge to bring to the community. So we added that part with the mouse, you know, as sort of a, you know, a bridge into that, into that world. And so it's, it, it's not, Com keeping the entire story, you know, it's trying to just make it work within this video game. And so for me, it's both making it exciting and interesting and just being a good writer. I mean, that's that's so important to me. Like, it's got to have good writing. Have every single thing I do, you know, um, has to have something that has that staying power. And and thankfully, when you're working with the elders' original voice, everything they say is literature, you know? And so it was taking that in and trying to be in that world and all the dialogue, everything that's written, feel, feel fresh and interesting and work within any construct, whether the you know, for me, the highest compliment is if the elders appreciate it. <laughs> so thankfully, my my uncles were were good with it. They they enjoyed it, you know, and and the elders uh, universally, pretty much. I thankfully I haven't even heard any complaints, you know, from the new path community, especially from from our elders. Yeah, so that's what I was, I was wondering that, about. I was yeah. wondering about that a, a game a game as a form of you know inheriting heritage and and how that would be received in that community it's certainly a great way for gaming community and others to to learn about um a culture and, and and you're right it's not like um you know you're learning facts about this thing but it's more about a, a a way of being and a way of interacting and how those interactions have consequences that's the sort of learning that i feel like the game engenders and um so it's, it's almost like um it's almost more cultural in that way than just learning about facts. It's like learning about how to be in that culture and with that environment. Um, but yeah, I was I was interested to hear how how the community received it as an artifact uh, for passing on um, these stories and, and this culture. Um, so um, that's interesting to hear that they were really receptive and that's really it's really cool that the form can evolve even though the, the stories and the and the richness of the culture. You know, uh, it's just a different vessel for it. Oh yeah, I, I think it was such of the outreach. In in, you know, elders don't want to go out and say, "I need to be a part of this." You got to include me. You know, so they were honored to be asked. You know, especially with these cultural insight videos that that they were, you know, in Never Alone. There's there's a a, a wide array of. Um, not just elders, but just new people, you know, talking about their, their way of life and 
and you, you have the range, you know, young people too, just talking, like, I mean, myself, relatively young, you know, um, and, and just that having those elders be, be included, and then, you know, with Never Alone, we work directly with, um, most directly with Ron Brower and um, Ron Snungatuck. Uh, Ron was just provided his knowledge throughout. Um, Ron Brower and Ron Snungatuck would, uh, did the, the narration. And with Foxtails, like I've been mentioning, my, my uncles, uh, Willie, Elmer, and John. So it was, I think that having that foundation was the most important part, you know, having them look at the script and, and offer their own thoughts on, on what it should be. You know, sometimes it wasn't on point, and so they would help us change a line, you know, because um, they're the ones who know, you know, like my Oscar Quigley, who is Yupik, uh, and a great scholar, you know, he said it takes you into the thought world of the ancestors when you go into the ancestral languages, the heritage languages. And as a Clinket speaker, I know that. You know, and I'm I'm just I'm learning just you know, I'm I'm you know, I wouldn't speak it right now, but I'm I'm learning in Upak as well. You know, my mom was a speaker. So it takes you into that world. And so, you know, for me, I didn't want it to be too much of a, you know, an English, you know, thing that then gets, you know, reconstructed in some way as a new bath. You know, so it had to be so much of the original voice of my grandfather. And then when um, my uncles were translating the script, you know, or not really even translating, but like making it come alive as a new bath. You know, out of the the guy, you know, some of the the framework that we asked them to work with. You know, that that was the script. You know, and then working with Sean Vesey, and we'd sit down with them. You know, up in Constitu, and and they would they would offer their words, and and they would ask questions, and we would ask questions of them, and then we we built it from that. And so, I think elders hearing the Nupak language, having it feel like it comes from their world which is the highest honor, like, like when they, they, they sign off on it in that, you know, in that way. That makes all the difference, you know. So, so just that outreach was, was just a, a major part of it. And so universally, I think the, the Nupak community, as far as I could tell, you know, obviously maybe there's, I mean, especially with my clinkus side, I'm, <laughs> You know, it, I, I'm not sure we'd able to do a, a clinket game. Very, I mean, I'm just being honestly. I'm, I'm, I'm an honest person. There's unfortunately so much disruption and you know um, negativity you could have in a lot of native communities, a lot of native communities. But in this case, it, it worked out just so nicely. Yeah, that's another question I had. Was it, did it originate in English? And then move to the original language, or did it sort of originate? I'm gonna I'm gonna kick it to Megan here. This was a part of the game that I got stuck in for a very long time. <laughs> Megan, how did you how did you navigate that? Can you tell us the water level? Yeah. So the two different the two different uh, sort of ancestral spirits, and then and then navigating those uh, the the currents. Oh, well, yeah, the current. So in this game, it seems like they're the, the water spirits and spirits of our has been like a prevalent part of the game. So, yeah, the ghost, some, the chat asked about the ghost like creatures. Um, and those are the water spirits or some type of um, more nature spirit, right? Correct me if I'm, it's like they're representing the spirit. So for that one, they're both um, they're blowing really strong currents. So the first one you have to move to get to the second one but the second one's current is blocking the exit so you have to move him out of the way and just swim around to the exit so you, the claw thing doesn't like eat you <laughs> whatever the ice is gonna eat you yeah i got eaten a lot <laughs> this one seems we have like on the, the, on the zoom morning. you can't hear the on twitch you can hear the noise that they make when they do get eaten and it's 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 sad and I felt very guilty <laughs> each and every time. Yes, uh, the sound so design yeah. is very good in this game. 
I'm glad that you. Uh, I'm glad that you didn't uh, make them experience that by by passing it quickly. Yeah, right now we're in the part of the story where we're trying to, uh, like Ishmael was uh, mentioning before, was we're disrupted. We've thrown this mouse into the water and we're trying to find him now, <laughs> trying to atone for that mistake. Um, I think a question I had earlier, and maybe it's a bit too early in the story to ask, was that during the cultural insight, we eventually get this larger mouse. And does that large mouse uh, directly like represent anything? Um, it's it's part of the story that my my grandfather told, and it was these two coastal brothers that had different, you know, um, strengths. One was super strong, and one was um, a very fast uh, runner and swimmer, and. It was this um, giant rat that was keeping, you know, basically, you know, taking up the, the lake, you know, the lake area next to the river. And it was their challenge to, to kill it, you know, really. So that's, that's really the story. Mm, okay. Okay, I see here we have another puzzle with the like water spirits and they have to blow out away the little claw things yeah and for me it, it's it, it, I'm, I'm gonna enjoy I want to enjoy like uh, watching and hearing your, your comments as well <laughs> um, on the gameplay like because um, a lot in in some of it's um you know, getting a reminder of, of what that, you know, that whole process and world was like, you know, going back to it. Yeah, I died a lot in the first game, honestly. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm not good at platformers. Um, this one isn't like the most tedious platformer I've ever played, but I do enjoy the puzzle. And this one has a lot more water level uh, than the first one, which I found interesting. Because yeah. I got, is it because it's warmer that you can be in the war water now? technically um <laughs> could be yeah like it was yeah they, they, but and then it's them going into the water to to kill that giant rat mm. you know so that's that's a lot of it and i think they the the team you know from a mechanics and art perspective design and art perspective they they enjoyed the underwater stuff you know from the original and then you know this became fun too you know, there was, I mean, it just, there's, it takes a little bit, it's a different challenge to have them sort of floating, floating around, you know, to do stuff rather than being pulled down by gravity. Yeah, the water level, oh my god, Fox, get over here. The water level in the first one was very, it's a late game feature and it was very much a surprise and different feeling once you got to it. Well, throughout the entire game, water had been a danger. <laughs> It, yeah. You died if you touched it. Yeah. Yeah. Megan, what kind of gaming do you typically do, and, and how different is this game from from those experiences? I I, I view games through the lens of my 11 year old son, and so try to try to engage with the games he's playing just to just to hang out some and 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 know what he's doing and and sort of be able to talk to him about it. And this is extremely different. Um, and I'm interested to introduce him to something like this because um, uh, it's such a different uh, experience. And, and what makes these two adventurers uh, successful is far different than what typically makes uh, a lead in, in, in the games that I've been playing with him successful. And so I just wanted to hear your, your point of view of how, did, how, how, does it, how different does it feel than, than some of the other games uh, you play or, or, or your colleagues play? You know, um, I, I'm actually, I haven't played games since I was a kid, you know, and, and which is funny for me because I'm now on my third uh, video game project to the, the, the last, well, Fox Tales is two, so this would be the fourth. Mm -hmm. So Fox Tales, is, it's, it's, it's its own game, really. And I'm, I, 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 you know, with these video games, you have to sign a confidentiality agreement. So. 
i can't really talk too much about it i could sort of talk about what i'm what i'm learning and and you know some things i'm i, I work on you know just from a structural uh, standpoint but that it's that's that's what's what's you know it's it's a, a bit i mean just what i'm learning about it though is it's larger industry now i think than hollywood Oh. You know, and how much people put their their time and energy into it, you know, and my, and my brother, um, who has sadly uh, passed on, he was a gamer all the time. So, you know, I, I so I grew up around it, you know, sort of that that 90s culture of, you know, um, of video games and, and, and played a lot of it, you know, um, growing up. You know, from the actually from the early '80s to the '90s, you know, end of the '90s, you know. So I, I had that exposure, and then um, as an adult, didn't have games too much. You know, it wasn't involved in games too much until really Never Alone. And and so it's coming from a from a you know like a literary guy. Like I'm, I got my MFA in, in poetry, creative writing. Um, and I, I, I write poetry books. I also wrote a comic book. You know, I spent my 20s in theater. You know, so I, I have a, a mind for this, you know, and, and that's, that was a big part of it. It wasn't just sort of trying to write a story for people. You know, so much of what, the automatic assumption, I think, which I've, I've fought, I, I, I would say fought against, is that native people are, are just consultants, you know? And and from the beginning, when we originally met, you know, we had this round table and I just, I went at it because I, I, I knew that, that could, it could be in that um, space of just, we tell people about ourselves and then the real creators go into their own place and create something. And then maybe they show it to us afterwards and then we maybe give them some thoughts and that kind of thing. And so there was always an assumption, e even today, there's people who assume, oh yeah, he helped with that game. Oh, he's a consultant for that game. Like, and no, I was involved in every aspect. You know, the, the design team showed me stuff that I, you know, it was especially working with um, creative director Sean Vesey, the, the depth of involvement that I had was almost like I, I it was, a, it was a approval, like uh, almost, I, I was one of the ones who said yes or no on whether a thing happens, you know, and that, that you know that was great you know i that that wasn't an official role but it just how it worked out it just that they that they respected my opinion and not just from uh you know a cultural authenticity perspective but from they, they respected me as as an artist and writer you know and so i had to put my mind into uh, learning about mechanics remembering what i know about games and and learning about mechanics and wanting to indigenize it and wanting to make it as you know infusing with you know the world as as much as possible so and and not strictly educational as i've been talking about like to have it in, enjoyable you know so so they showed us some games and like there's a game from i think you know 2012 12 or something like that um limbo yeah i think it's called limbo yeah and that was a really really neat indie game that they showed and we played for a while you know the team from eli and media and it's black and white and it's got like a certain um, vibe to it so so for me i i i related to that and i talked to the team about um how well, originally, they tried doing it, and it was more like a cartoon. You know, it was more like a Disney cartoon. And then we, we looked at that Limbo game, 
And then I had, I'd been talking to them about how it's, it's what it's like to be out in nature, that it's, it's meditative. It's like you could sit back and you, you, your, your mind, you're thinking deeply, you're thinking about your life and you're, you're taking in the sights and sounds and you're feeling um, a, it, it, it's like a, an atmosphere, it's a milieu, you know? And so um, even down to the sound, I, I, I talked to them about Brian Eno, you know? And for those who know Brian Eno, you know, that you could see, listen to the sound in the game and, and you, could, you, you could pick up the, the influence, you know? Um, that bright, you know, some sort of, you know, nice, calm, meditative, um, where your mind is, is awake, you know, um, and, and ready to, to handle the challenges around you, but not like your adrenaline's going, ah, you know, so with the, your question about how it relates to other games. I think, you know, as I observe, you know, even though I'm not much of a gamer and observing people, like they're in a state, you know, just with your thumbs too, and, you know, or, you know, your, your digits, you know, you could be in a state which is, you know, your adrenaline glands, you know, your, and your posture, you know, I think about this as I think about my body and training, <laughs> you know, like that all the time, you know, which can be, uh, a re you know, I could just imagine, like, I, I, you know, I read an article about dopamine addiction, you know, um, from social media, from games, from, from uh, television and streaming. Like there's a certain, and, and in video games also, adrenaline addiction. You know, so I think that that's a distinction that I, I'd, I'd say. So it's it's on those that meditative side. And I think there's 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 also a lot of games like, you know, um, my kids play Minecraft a lot and the Sims games, you know, which hopefully, you know, for some isn't always that strain on the mind and body. And then you get stuck in that state and addicted to that state, you know, in this you're solving stuff you're thinking and and like you got to enjoy the 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 intellectuality of the mechanics you know it's not necessarily an intellectual game or a didactic game in terms of it needs to teach you something but you gotta you gotta be with that state of you're responding to your environment and you gotta think intelligently through it and be one of those people that enjoys that you know it takes that it's that kind of gamer you know, it's what it's that that's what it asks of the game. Yeah, it, it was really refreshing uh, to just that just the kind of state you're 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 describing, but also like what what gets you through tasks uh, is very different. Um, it, it's it's more thoughtful. Um, you have to you have to engage with nature and the um, and those spirits um, in a thoughtful way and on their terms. Uh, you're not you're not in control you're not um you're not doing things your way and and beating those elements the spiritual or the or, or the natural you're engaging with them on their terms in order to pass the test and move on to the next bit of landscape or or or, or town or, or whatever it is um and so that felt i i, I was for a second i was beating my you know beating my head against the wall i was like i'm gonna I have to defeat this this task, you know, and then and then and then once that wasn't working quite a bit, you have to like take a step back and be like, all right, what am I doing wrong here? And just the whole mindset was wrong. It's just like I'm going to communicate with the elements, with this, um, you know, with the spirit, and try to figure out, all right, is this better to be the fox? What, what skills does the fox have, or what what shape, you know, what what uh, or or what does um, you know, is it better to be human in this in this scenario? Um, and and what is the sort of spirit asking of me? And and how do I how do I get them to, to help me with the elements? And um, you're right, it is it is very different, at least from the games 
you know, that I've been introduced to through my, through my son. And the way that you describe it is, was our hopes, you know, for sure. The, the sense of cooperation, like that, that the, there's the, the Fox and Nuna need to, you know, one needs to do another thing. And, and, you, and if you're having one player, the AI may be not always be doing what the Fox is, you know, um, what we need from, to get to the next thing, you know? And so that's why it's the cooperation. Like if you have two players, you're both, you know, okay, you, you do that, you jump on that and then wait until I get there. And then, you know, that kind of thing. Like you need that kind of uh, mentality that you can't move on until you're working together and, and you can't move on until you're working together with the land as well. You know, I, I talked about that quite a bit is in, in more of a Western worldview, it's like um, man versus everything, man versus God, man versus himself. And I, I use that gendered term because it, that is a, more of a Western bias, you know, um, man versus nature, you know. And in this case, it's we're all you know, we're all in this together, you know, and we want having, that's what I'm talking about, having it reflect in the mechanics, you know, that um, nature will be harsh and it can be harsh and difficult and ambivalent, super powerful yet ambivalent um, up, up north or, or just in any, any, any natural environment. And it, yet it can also be tremendously giving, you know, so between those spirits and also like the iceberg, the iceberg isn't always going to float away. Sometimes maybe that iceberg has its own mind and it pities or cares about the people and wants to help. So that, that iceberg will take you along, you know, same thing with the wind and, ra and rain and the weather, you know, um, the snow and an anything like that, that like, those things can be just as helpful as they are something for you to overcome or something that is maybe you might feel is attacking you. You know, it's, it goes both ways. And, and that's more reflective of the, of the indigenous worldview that we talked about. So that's, that's what I'm talking about, wanting to embed it into the actual gameplay. And, and I think the balance is nice because it's not that there isn't danger. There's definitely danger. I was eaten many times. <laughs> but that's, that's a reality. You know, there's a polar bear or a, or a sea creature. Um, yeah. And so uh, that balance is, is struck nicely. Megan, how, how, rare, how rare are some of those things, based on your, your more experienced gamer than both of us, how rare are some of those elements and some of those feelings and atmospheres um, to, you know, in, the game, in the gaming world? would you say i feel i feel like it depends on the game you're playing but it's not the most common of aspects like you mentioned limbo and then um the sequel to that is a game called inside um, and i've played both of those and they're also equally atmospheric as this one is and like you're trying to figure out um the overall story as you're playing it so those games also rely on it mostly a lack of dialogue but like you're just trying to figure out the story um and i feel like the popular genre as of right now is like the the core uh like the the whole like action pack the battle royale is like the big genre right now where it's like everybody's like fighting for the top and then most mmos or multiplayer games will go will will be more of like yeah just like you know build a settlement doesn't matter like it's about all about the consumption of everything and like the building rather than like having a game that is around the world itself and how you would interact with it while keeping like a balance Mo most games lean towards more the western culture of how to interact with the world and I, I wish there were more games like this where it's kind of a balance of both of them you have to you have to respect the other one like yeah different if you had like a game where it's like different trees or consequences depending on like how much you built it up versus how much you preserved I think would be a nice change for that typical formula 
Um, and I think it could be done well in those types of genres where it's the genre of I don't know, the building simulator genre. Like, I don't know, there's a beaver one recently. It's called Timborn, and you're just a bunch of beavers building stuff out of wood. <laughs> um, and I don't, I don't know if it has like a lot of that preservation type of ideology, even if you are beavers. <laughs> it's just, it's the same concept, but it's beavers. That, that worldview reflection that you're talking about, I, I, I think is, is excellent to think about because, you know, there's, there's basically the bigger companies, and I mean, I'm currently working for a bigger company, you know, um, for, for the video game. Um, so it's not um, black and white for me. But typically the bigger, bigger companies want to create addictions. <laughs> so everything that we take in, like listening to us right now, watching, watching this, this um, what we're doing right now, it, it's, it's, it's like it's food. It's food for the mind, spirit, body, you know? And I think so much of the, um, the bigger companies want to make a, like an addiction, m m turn these things into drugs. So that's, w when I think about this, I think about what the body is doing, you know, oh, yeah, I've got to always take, take over that thing, you know? Um, and I, I mean, my most interactions with people, I, I think about how this reflects on, on human beings that I see, mainly men, you know, who just, you know, when I, when I interact with them, I get the sense that they're trying to outdo me, just like talking with them, like, you know, dominate and, and you know, and like, that's how they see life. And I think um, gaming and other media can feed into that, like creating that addiction, you know, um, uh, or feeding into that addiction so they can have, you know, eyeballs on the screen, you know, or, or interacting with something and keep you there. You know, they're competing for time. You know, like the a Netflix executive said, like their, their competition isn't <laughs> the other, uh, you know, the other companies right now, the competition is sleep, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, so, so there's, there's a lot of that. And, and so we, again, we had talked about that with, with the company, with Eli Media working on this and Sean Vesey and the team, you know, we, we, that feeling you have of, yeah, there's, there might, you might be into that, like, you know, which I don't want to, again, I don't want to create a, a stereotype of that, but there, there is, there's a lot of that though, you know, um, beyond, you know, beyond the stereotype, there's a lot of reality in that, but what we talked about when playing this game, that feeling of, oh, you know, you can be very engaged and awake and alert in a lot of ways, but that that feeling of med of a meditative quality like when a hunter is out and you know they could see far into the tundra they could almost feel when that animal is there they know like if they're in a snowstorm they know how to get out of that snowstorm they they know the methods to to dealing with things and they could almost they, there's almost a psychic connection with the animal that they're hunting. My mom had always told me that when a hunter gets an animal, the animal gives itself to you. And that's, that's the kind of mental state. You know, the elders talk about constantly clearing the pathway outside the house. Because it's like you, when you clear that pathway, you're clearing your, your pathway to the things you want in life to the success and vision that you want or the animal that you're going after, it opens up the doors literally for you, you know? And it's that kind of mental state that indigenous peoples are, are taught. And that, so it takes you out of that, um, you know, that addictive, you know, um, mode that I'm talking about. And, and puts you into that, hopefully, you know, uh, uh, thankfully a lot of game players have described, you know, that kind of phenomena for themselves. 
you know, in response to the skin and that puts you a little bit into that, that state of, you know, um, you're clearing a pathway. Yeah, this, oh, no, sorry, ahead. I was about to Go say, ahead. like, this was one of those moments where you have to, like, this puzzle in particular was actually one where you have to, uh, do that co-op experience because it was one I had to quickly switch between both Nuna um, and the fox which is not something I've had to do at this point like I had to throw the rock down then go to the fox to guide the spirit so I could like change the bubble at the same time as the rock is falling um, it's a very very like engaging puzzle but I'm also really relaxed even though I'm a little scared of these hand things in the ice <laughs> all the time <laughs> And, and that and in the, the thing is, though, <laughs> in, in, in some cases, there are not, I mean, people will still, you know, especially if they don't give the, the game much of a chance, I think, or just whatever their personality, how they see nature and that kind of thing, you know, um, like from the beginning of Never Alone, you're chased by a polar bear right at the start, and that freaks, that's freaks people out. It's scary. You know, like, you're feeling, ah, yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, and it does put them in that adrenaline state if they don't give it a chance, um, or just that's that's their own their own um, you know personality. And one of the reviews, you know, especially at the beginning, there was a lot of um, you know kind of maybe uh, sort of diminishing reviews. Um, and it took a while; it took, it took a few months before it suddenly you know the people recognized you know, what, what we were doing um, and, and gave it a chance. But one of the first reviews that came out was, you know, never alone, you get to watch a girl die over and over again. <laughs> you know? like, um, and so that, that concept of even if, you know, in this case, you don't have, you know, there's not a, a, a certain amount of deaths that you get where you have to go back to the, you know, you only die three times and you have to play the whole game over again. You know, there's not that kind of thing. You, could, you know, um, you just go back a certain, to a certain benchmark, mm -hmm. you know, when, when there's, there's a death in it. And, and so it's, but there's a lot of people who experience that as a difficult thing, as, as a, a kind of um, violence, you know. And so in, in yet, yet in our our mindset was was more like it's it's you know thankfully we're not actually out in nature and, and go you know you typically you don't go through these put yourself in these super dangerous situations alone you know and that's part of what this this thing is about never alone mm. she has to find um, Nuna and the fox have to find their relationships and their connections. It's an, it's an, you know, a, a different heightened experience. And so it's, it's, you know, part of that, you know, trial and error with, with the deaths is recognizing the reality of being out in that kind of environment. Yeah, speaking, speaking of the deaths, um, for anyone who hasn't played the game, I'm gonna mention the spoiler. So, you know, you can tune out for like, <laughs> five minutes as I talk about it but in the in the first game um there's the part in the in like the I don't know probably three quarter of the way where the the bad guy like kills the fox <laughs> and I want it me I, I this type of game like these general like ambient narrative games are really good because I'm always super emotionally invested in them but also I've never been more emotionally invested in this fox character in any other game me and the mod we're crying on the stream <laughs> when that happened because I was so devastated by this fox dying. <laughs> and I guess that, that relates back to the reality of the, you know, the reality of death. But I also wanted to ask, like, was in the original story of the blizzard, is, is there, does the fox die in that story? <laughs> yeah. In, in the case of um, the original with Never Alone, um, we worked with we, we added so much more. We added so much more com compared to the original. Like, like the Manslayer is is a common story that's told throughout, you know, by the New Country, by so so many different 
wonderful, wonderful versions of that story. And that's, that's not actually in the original Robert uh, Cleveland story. You know, and so it, what, it, was, it was just a man, you know, um, uh, overcoming the winds in, in a, a short story. And so we, we wanted to use as much with Robert Cleveland as, as possible. Really. But there was so much in terms of creating the world that, that we, um, we worked on. And, and we worked with um, Minnie Gray as well, you know. Um, she, it, I had actually, unfortunately, not, not seen her. Um, I wasn't one part of the team that went, went to her, but they, they went to Minnie Gray, who was Robert Cleveland's daughter, who had um, only just a few years ago passed on. And she was one of the master storytellers in the world. You know, um, and so she uh, learned about what, what we had done and, and, you know, signed off on it, which was really, really, really nice. You know, so yeah, there was, we, we um, added a lot of stuff, but uh, with the approval of the elders, you know, and trying to maintain that world. Uh, Megan, I wanted to ask, have you ever played it uh, with two people? No, or you're just, I really just wish, one? I really wish I could, honestly. I, I feel like it'd be a very interesting challenge. The, cause most games are have co-op, but they're not designed in a way to be co-op. Um, like, well-designed. Like, this game is designed to have co-op. I Like, it take advantage. You should take advantage of the co-op. I just can't. <laughs> Um, I, a game recently that also is made that way is it's a game called It Takes Two, um, and it's about it's about like a, a like a, a married couple who are like interested in filing a divorce and they get turned into puppets um, because their daughter doesn't want them to separate and stuff and so the whole game is about them trying to become human again but as little dolls and things and they have each of them has their own skill that they have to do and the whole story is about them learning to cooperate as you the players are trying to cooperate to surpass these puzzles in the game and it's a very good story so like having a game that would be co-op would be great to play but I, I haven't done this uh. this was this was fun by the way figuring out how to um, how to have the giant rat you know how to how to make it work and I remember talking about it, I, you know, like, does it need to be, you know, a big rat swimming around all, like, all over the place? And you have to think about it mechanically. Like, there's something to it just being, you could see the, you know, you know the big scary face and the, the eyes and then it, it going, it popping out, you know, like a, you know, like a hackamore, <laughs> you know? Yeah. There's something uh, cool to that um, mechanics-wise. And it's not even, you know, um, part, of, part of it is you just get to see what, what the, what the uh, uh -huh. team is capable of. <laughs> it's something really uh, terrifying you know, about it. <laughs> <laughs> he's not swimming around, but he's there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you got to see what the design team is capable of and, and also just within the framework, like, um, you yeah. could do a lot with, with, you know, with a little, you know, like, you, you think about the mechanics of that, it's, it's actually not that much, but it's, it's, it's effective, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's and it's a decision. It's a decision point. How yeah. how is this depicted? And a decision, you know, has has a lot of implications throughout. Um, you know, it, it would change the whole feeling of the game to have it as another sort of being swimming around as opposed to lurking. Yeah. So it's, it's a really cool, really cool decision. Um, <clears throat> wanted to talk a little bit about. Um, sort of those kinds of decisions, not necessarily from design, but from the writing. Um, that's kind of why they asked me to be on the stream. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a poet and I run a bookstore and I run a, a poetry press. And so kind of getting the aspect of uh, the, write, the writer's aspect of it. And you've mentioned um, striving for good writing in, in um, all aspects of, of the game. And 
what what is what is the how different is the approach because um, your your poems do this you know your poems um tell stories a bit and and depict a culture and have a have a pace that that feels i mean obviously i'm directly juxtaposing with the game because i'm playing the game i'm reading sure. your poems i like that um, um and but so i was wondering from your point of view because from a reader i can see lots of lots of uh similarities um in terms of just like lyric moments or or learning or atmosphere or just like uh, comporting a culture um, but from your standpoint how different is it to use this form uh obviously very different but i mean like from those moments from those those real impactful moments how, how how do you how do you get into those two different modes or how different are they or how how similar are they maybe they're not that different uh, for you to me they're very very similar um just my my approach to writing is that everything is just different genres i'm i'm a traditional storyteller especially if, if clink it because that's that's the language i i speak now i'd like to get to in the back because i know and tell them about stories in English. And um, like my mom had told me this, you know, that's that's my original exposure. It's my mom, my new back mom telling me stories um, and raising me with the, the awareness, you know, a lot of the, the, the traditional way of thinking. And both my parents were also actually poets. You know, my mom um, published a book of poetry with um, Ishmael Reed, who I'm named after. And he um, is considered the father of multiculturalism. He originally outreached to my parents, you know, and that's how they they became connected because it was, you know, the <clears throat> the rise of multiculturalism, um, you know, in the seventies, basically. And and I so I had, I'd been raised in a cultural environment, in in a lot of ways a traditional environment, but also a very uh, intellectual uh, environment of, of po poets and teachers, my parents poets and teachers. And so the, the poetry, and so whether it, whether it's poetry, which I consider lyric romantic poetry, where it's a personal lyric, that's a genre of English, you know, coming out of its own, um, you know, genre form and, and intellectual uh, history you know and and its own atmosphere like atmosphere is really big to me like with this with this game and 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 with my poetry atmospheric i like that you say that you know and so it or or if i'm telling a traditional story in 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 the clinket language or doing clinket oratory you know those those are very very distinct uh genres and and in the case of a video game you're you're working with a form, you know, like like we're talking about so much, which I, I love. I love this discussion on mechanics and this interplay with with indigenous methodologies, indigenous worldviews, the the oral literature. I love that um, that that connection between how do you marry these two um, genre, these different genres and forms, you know, and and then just basic script writing and, and the cut scenes, you know, um, which Never Alone, I think, probably had more of, you know, um, where there's the interaction with the, uh, the owl, you know, and, you know, like the, when, when the fox dies, you know, and how the fox transforms into uh, a young boy. And since we're, you know, doing spoilers right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> All, all those things, those cutscenes, to me, are creating. You, you, you're you're writing a scene. It's it's so it's like a TV or or film. You know, and that's what I'm doing actually uh, quite a bit of with this other game that I'm working on with a with a writing team. You know, um, which I can't mention, um, but it's it's great to do that. Like, it, you're you're writing a script. And and as you walk, you hear the story, the storyteller, the narrator, 
you know, in both Never Alone and Fox Tales. You're writing a narration, you know. And so there, there are all these different um, genres that each of them have, you know, I, I want to learn as much as I can about those genres, how to do that form, that structure, the intellectual history, the worldview that it, that it, it, it expresses, do all the research, whether it's my own culture or a European form or another form. You know, I, I, it's why I listen to these audiobooks, you know, because I'm getting my third poetry collection out. And, and I'm also going to write an epic in the Klinka language and then have it in bilingual form translated in, in English. So I, I do have the lyric, which is a, its own. I mean, poetry has been whittled down, I think, to just that, the romantic lyric. One small poem that sort of reflects your life a little bit and, and, and it comes from one mind and um, well, I mean, that, that could be debated, you know, and discussed, but, you know, the idea is that it comes from one individual personality and, and it has been, that, that's, that's considered poetry now, which I think is a very impoverished literature. You know, we, we, we live in a very literate time, but not a literary time. And, and so we lose so much of that meaning and, and richness and vitality and, you know, um, ways of expressing oneself and, and, and leaping outside of oneself, I believe. You know, when you, when you have a literary moment, it's almost uh, philosophical. You know, in fact, I get this from reading, uh, I have this, this feeling from reading uh, Frederick Nietzsche. Or, or Homer, I think in particular those, those two writers, you know, so one's an oral literary artist and one's a philosopher, but where it's, you're leaping outside of your own understanding just a little bit, you know, and my, one of my friends and mentors, he calls it the shock of the real, you know, where everything comes out of a certain type of tradition, Everything, you know, every every literary form, you know, as much as romanticism tries to separate itself from tradition, you know, um, and tries to make people follow their own mind, which, you know, in, in our case, is like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Look at um, so yeah, that's just one of the moments where I finally, you finally get it coming out, you know. <laughs> Um, and so what I want with everything is to know that tradition. Uh, tradition is a structure in that form that I'm talking about. And intellectual history, that's a tradition. Genre. Know that form, know that genre, know that tradition. And infuse it with the shock of the real. And so Robert Bringers talks about Michelangelo and Titian and the, the great Native American myth tellers doing this. They take a tradition and they infuse it with the shock of the real. And so I want that as you know, maybe you're not even paying attention to the words, you know, but if you want to go back to it, and that's part of the staying power that I hope for, you're going to feel that in the words and and also feel that in the gameplay that's why the mechanics are so, so important that's that's a literature that's that's a, a language in its own way that's part of the work that's why i wanted to work so closely with uh the design the design team and the art team so that it always has that it's like it's it's a literary document and you know um there's a lot of words here um, but, um, you know, I, I'd say that, uh, you know, you could do that completely with mechanics. You know, um, Beth LaPonce, uh, an Anishinaabe, you know, one, one, an, an amazing woman, um, artist, um, game dev, you know, um, she talks about Doom and uh, John Romero. 
was one of the main Doom creators. So, so that originally opened up that three-dimensional world. Even though it's a shooter, it opened up that three-dimensional world. You know, my, my brother used to play it all the time. You know, uh, my friends played it all the time. And John Romero was one of those, one of the main creators of it. And who came up with that, you know. And uh, John Romero is indigenous. He's, he's Native American. And Beth LaPonce uh, has suggested, you know, as a game theorist, that it was indigenous methodologies, indigenous worldview that informed that creation of that kind of three-dimensional world that um, John Romero opened up in the gaming industry. And John Romero was there when she she talked about it, <laughs> so he agreed. Um, and I, I very much agree with that. You know, thinking multidimensionally, um, visualizing, putting yourself into, you know, um, open, opening up new pockets of, of experience and meaning, I, I think is, it's not, um, it's not, I'd say, you know, only particular to Native people, Indigenous peoples, but it's it, that, that type of um, visualization and, and, and growth and leap of understanding, I think is definitely fostered within indigenous communities. Yeah, I think there's a similar narrowness to what you're talking about and sort of liter literature versus literary, you know, c can happen in games too. Uh, the same voices and the same forms and the same cultures are being consulted and depicted um that's just limiting the genre just like just like you're you're sort of mentioning um you know sort of the romantic influence on on contemporary poetry um you know i think that same is true because you know i have a lot of devices in my house and my son uses a lot of them and I, so i'm exposed to a certain kind of thing but this was a rebel this was a revelation in terms of the genre and the form um and i think um i think i think you're right i, I think Another thing that was interesting is, you know, you're talking about listening, listening to things, um, listening to literature and the voices in this game. And, and Megan talks about the um, just the audio scape uh, in general um, really adds something to it, too, the sort of oral and aud auditory aspects of the game. But hearing hearing an elder talk, you know, um, is is was novel for me in a game, you know? And yeah. it added so much to it um, that I hope, I hope games, you know, I, I, hope it, I hope this sort of thing influences, you know, how games are developed or um, broadens, broadens the way game, games are developed for sure. That's, um, yeah, and that's the thing that any new, any indigenous language and like I'm, I, I, I trace my family history. I'm, I'm actually part Welsh too. That's that's indigenous too. You know, um, you, you think that's white or, or English or part of the empire, but no, they, they fought against the empire, you know, and and that's that's indigenous and the language is indigenous. Um, Celtic Gaelic languages are, you know, so I, I think any indigenous language will, will somehow have um, a freshness and provide a nutrient to the body that I think um, in indigenous, I, mean, I think English or other colonial languages, maybe maybe they lose for some, just for some reason, you know, be, um, because of the way that they're used. You know, they, they adopt a certain framework. And so when you just hearing, whether you know Anupak or not, just hearing it, I think will take you into that that kind of that kind of world and the, the elder's voice, the elder being themselves, being their self, you know, and that's a, you, you, they have a visceral joy speaking their language. And you could feel that you could feel that in the vibrations of the voice. So um, I'd like to run to the bathroom real quick, though. So if I could yeah, yes, speak sir. right back.
Yes, chat says specifically whilst two was repressed in that instant. Megan, so we mi we missed a lot. <laughs> I, I, the rat appeared. I saw him, or her, or it, and um, and uh, and then I saw credits. What happened? Well, we killed. We we did unlock all the videos. Chat. We killed the rat, so I can go back without us jumping out. We have we've stuck in the last area, and we had to grab his tail multiple times and then he was so mad he was like climbing to eat us so we're like no we gotta get out because he was knocking everything around and then and then he got crushed by the bank and so what i was saying at the end is that there's a picture of a bank where the supposed the rat was crushed and you can see where the bank is eroded the dry mouse was very scary chat i agree every time it was terrifying <laughs> since we're talking about sound design and of course you can't hear it but like he's got the, the music in it is like very low and like rumbling and thing and it's very different. I don't know what instrument it was, um, but the music for that section is very different from the main game. Um, and then it's like every time the ma mouse like roars it, it's terrifying. <laughs> it's, it's odd, terrifying. I appreciate you saying it was the zoom sound issue, that oh, the yeah. reason why I didn't hear it and not my gaming skills that didn't actually <laughs> make it make it to the stage where I could hear the rap. No, no. No, I'm sure him yelling would have interrupted the conversation. <laughs> right, right. Um, well, that's cool. Yeah. So how many times have you finished it? Uh, oh my god, I missed a cultural insight. I'm going to have to go fix that. Um, I've finished the first game. I've only beaten these once. So this is the first time okay. I've played both of these. I have to replay this. The so so the, the cultural insights, it's not just about passing stages. Obviously, you missed something even though you finished the game. <laughs> Somehow you missed that. What? How do you unlock those? There are there are little owls in the stage ah, yeah. that you have to like get to. So one of them early on, I think it was probably for the ice season of lice. And I had a little platformer that I had to jump back to get the owl. Um, gotcha. Yeah. So we're talking. About, we're just talking about the end of the game. I have to go back and find this one. <laughs> missed one. Um, so you beat the game in an hour. Yep. It's been an hour. That's <laughs> That's, I'm glad. <laughs> that was the general idea, like hour, two hours for folks to take longer. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I'm glad. I was hoping to get through the the game itself and like while we were talking. That's why I wanted to play the DLC versus the the big game. The big game took about four hours to beat the first time. Oh, cool. So, oh, you shade the um, and are you thinking about showing the cultural uh, insights right now? Yeah, yeah, we can do some of them. I have to go back and find this one. I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> so we can do that but it looks like um i assume you have watched all of these or know what they're about yeah we can... and and just for review before this so i wanted to watch them again so i watched them yesterday mm -hmm. so. yeah so we got so far we got season of the life ice story and then respect for all things so i got we'll start yeah. with uh start with the season of life again you guys won't hear it you guys can read i mean it's sure. not you know what it is but for the twitch we have this one. I think this was early on unlocked, probably around the start. Um, I wasn't raised here, but my mom talked about how it'd be so dark. Yeah, it was dark in the wintertime. Uh, in, in December 21st, we see the sun for about three hours. Um, Just looking at myself in court. The, the days yeah. start to get longer right after that. Sort of and this time. is your uncle? My mom. Yeah, in Uncle in Louis. Story, he's, he's the voice you hear in, the, in Fox Tales. Everyone comes alive. Just because they've been inside so long. I'm all exactly from the Springs there because the caribou are migrating north. Uh, the bears are coming out of hibernation. And, uh, rabbits and things are all, <laughs> all over the place. They're not hiding under the snow mm -hmm. anymore. You know, like the elders used to tell me, as um, soon as they saw those Is snow this hunting the, small birds, the seal hunting one? the new season would start. I don't know. <laughs> that would be good. I, I'd love to, because he tells one about the seal hunting. Or going out in the ice. I'll have to try to see if we have it. Oh, is that a base game one? Um, it, it, uh, base game? What are you talking about? Foxdale. Not the Foxdale. Not the Foxdale. Right the Neverland. No, 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 it's in, it's in this one. It's in this one. 
Earth bat. Go look at Beaver. Beaver. <laughs> and so it's they heard. A, they heard you just, talking about Beaver. All the gathering mm. activities, all the busyness, and mm, it's when credits. the life really springs up again. Uh, that's what I was talking so the difference between the winter and the spring and it's even in the visuals you can see that too the base game uh, Never Alone is uh, it's a lot moodier like because the blizzard is constantly going so when you first boot up the level and you see the actual like sun in the abyss and like the reflecting it's, it's very warming it's very it's charming <laughs> One thing I wanted to ask about, you, you'd mentioned sort of the, the industry growing and, you know, being bigger than Hollywood. And certainly our, our area where we are physically, geographically located in North Carolina is a, is a hub of game development as um, Epic Games is here. Uh, our university, North Carolina State University, has a game development program. We as the libraries have all sorts of gaming spaces and game development spaces. And you were talking about propriety and... Um, you know, sort of being secret. Our game lab, the, the actual glass, you can fog it up, like so a professor or researcher can fog up the glass so no one can see in what's on the screen if they're, <laughs> if they're dealing with something proprietary. So that all that all rang true. My, my question was um, sort of the values of a company, because um, you talked about sort of like perpetuating addiction and that being the goal. and. and it was the saddest thing ever when you <laughs> when you were like Netflix's competitor is sleep, <laughs> um, and so so um, so yeah. How 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 did this? How do companies have such different values? So like, in this game, it's refreshing to not have any like purchase options Microtransactions. or you know <laughs> Nuna Nuna needs to change her outfit or <laughs> or or whatever you know Nuna like um, Nuna's gonna dress up like a banana um and so there's none of that interaction no no sort of commerce or capitalism sort of in inflex impacts the game you know while you're playing it um mm -hmm. and so what is it about the can you talk about working with a with a company that has values so that you can watch five minute documentaries while you're playing? You can you can avoid those kinds of purchasing pressures. I know for for a, a small kid especially, they just want to they want that thing, and so they're like, I'm gonna try to buy that, you know. And so so yeah, can you talk a little bit about the values of of, of working with a company that produces a game like this? Yeah, yeah. I think I think with you know, um, my son. We we had those those purchasing things. Like sometimes we'd have like an extra charge on our account, and so we had to switch the password and talk with him about it. Um, and you know, I I'd say I mean it's like there's overlap. Like we like it's good to you know earn a living. I think that's that's part of the like Cook Inlet Tribal Council. You know, wanted to have you know, amazing sales. And, and based on the reviews and the reaction, uh, that was, that was, you know, it, it had tremendous, it, it made its money back. Um, Fox sales made its money back like they, they, like they made, and, and probably over some. But in terms of an investment and, and for the time that you put in, you know, and, and they, they, they had talked about this, like, I, so I'm, I'm, I, it's not really my place to talk too much about the business there. But um, just from what I, what I see, though, um, now they're not making more games, you know, um, because of the, the time and investment that had they had to put into that. Um, and, and they're a service organization. I mean, they, they bring in you know, um, a lot of a lot of their uh, how they how they uh, you know run as an organization is through grants, large large grants, federal grants, and that sort of thing. And, and branching out into something like gaming was part of their hope of being sustain, sustainable as their own organization. And, and um, um, Gloria O'Neill, the CEO, has has talked about this most directly. You know, and but yet my observation is seeing that they didn't 
they didn't um, meet a certain benchmark with their, with their board and with the organization to keep producing games. And to me, that's a sad thing. You know, um, they didn't lose money, as far as I could tell. It had tremendously positive impact, had affected people. And yet, as a business model, you know, um, how can you make some games like this beyond a one-time deal? You know, um, and so it, 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 could be, it could be a challenge. It, it could definitely, definitely be a challenge. And so with these other two games, these are with larger companies, actually. Like, one of them might be, uh, one, one of them were just in the development, you know, process, and it still hasn't been green lit. But yet I've I've been working with them developing it. I mean, if it does, you know, that, that'll be one of those big games, you know, triple A, you know, for those who, you know, the different gradations in terms of its budget. Um, so um, Never Alone leans in the indie side, even though it had a larger budget than a lot of indie games. A lot of indie games, it's only like, um, you know, like whatever, like a $10,000, $50,000 budget. And this had you know, significantly more investment than that, um, to the point where you know you could you could you know we're able to really develop it, spend two years on it, you know, um, try it something and then have it sort of fail in our eyes, you know, or, or not be up to our standards, and have to go in a totally different direction, and, and that's where they, they started really working with me actually. Um, and I, I would say it's all my, due to my influence, you know, for the change, but I was a big part of that change. So, um, but yeah, you're just thinking about the business side of it. Like, it, it's good to, you know, for games like this, to be able to make, make, make decent sales, like, and it has decent sales, but like, like, be hits, you know, it got the media attention, but how can we make games like these hits you know and uh i love black panther you know that that's that's a huge you know success that um you know really highlights of people and where people could be super proud of it you know and i'd love to do something like that with native communities take take people into that different fantasy world you know, so I, I think you can you can do it. Part of it's the business model. Part of it is growing, you know, like in some ways, Never Alone maybe is a groundbreaker in terms of it, its outreach. You know, it won a BAFTA, a British Academy Award for best debut game, you know, and and it got all this attention and it has a staying power that we're talking about, you know, and, and there should be a sustainability business-wise for that. There should be an ability to make all kinds of games like this. You know, um, I'd like to see that happen. So, so I, I, so how do we do it in a way that's not like like we're talking about creating a game that's got that addiction and um, has crass capitalism but can work within a capitalistic environment. You know, you need uh, an audience willing to, to, you know, commit to that. Um, you need um, teams and people really, really up for, for, for achieving something like this, where, where the standard is the highest standard. You know, um, Sean Vesey, some of these teams, they did, they did work on those AAA games. You know, um, Sean Vesey used to run the uh, Tomb Raider franchise, you know, um, and went into this for having that longing to work on a something meaningful, you know. And so I, I, I that that's some of the conversation I'm having with. Um, so one of the games is still in development. One of them um, were just in production. <laughs> And we got a deadline and like, oh, it's, it's amazing, you know? And so the thing is, if you're working with native people, if you don't have native people on a team, you're appropriating, it's, called, it's appropriation. 
you're taking someone else's stories and, and you're 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 you know you're you're stealing basically if you're you not working with people you know and, and so that's part of my involvement with, with this these other two games you know and there are larger companies and I, I want them to be as successful as as possible and with a lot of this this uh these vitalities and values that are that are in never alone and i think you can get there you know i th i think you can get there um it, it does take to to get a, a big game out there you know um how it does take getting people's attention you know um it does take you know having an adventure having something exciting having something um that'll that'll people want will want to put their time into it so you, when you when you talk to people about, oh this is educational sometimes that could turn people off like you know i already go to school like i don't need to go to school after school you know what i mean um but so that's why with never alone it, it was always in foxtails it, it was always you got to make a great game first you know and and with these other gaming projects I'm, I'm working on, you know, I, I use models like Black Panther and, and other really rich storytelling uh, genres, whatever media they're in, as, as inspiration, you know, because the, the original stories and the original culture isn't just didactic educational. Like, that shouldn't be a dichotomy. Like the elders, all the elders talk about the, the you know, and I, I mentioned that in, in one of the cultural insight videos, all the elders talk about how it's better than TV, the original stories, you know, it, it, it elicits a certain kind of mind framework. And they're longing for that. There really, really is. Like I, I like with getting into my Welsh, um, you know, ancestry, my, my Welsh heritage, being Welsh, loving being Welsh. Hope is a clan name, you know? I carry the clan name, which is beautiful to me. Um, so the, I like Arthurian legends. And when you go into the original medieval uh, literature, that's just as great as, that's got all the oral literature. You know, and so there are there is longing for that. You know, I think even in people with European uh, backgrounds, you know, the the Green Knight has just come out, and that's an Arthurian legend. But I think the original Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, <clears throat> written by the Gawain poet, you know, is probably better than any movie you're going to watch. You know, so I want to be a part of that original vitality whether it's Arthurian legend medieval Homer Beowulf or um, another or the Serbo you know Croatian epic poetry which I love you know the great um, Bosnian Homer Avdo Medjedovic who lived into the 1950s you know that kind of world and that kind of vitality blossoming in um, our modern world because I think there's a longing for it and it's reflected in um, things like Never Alone or something like this this movie The Green Knight that just came out a few months ago yeah some of the some of the issues feel similar to the poetry world I'm sure you've experienced um, the press is folding because the, the work is not worth the the return or um, or just exhausting and maybe not rewarding enough or this valuable thing you've created you know doesn't go anywhere it doesn't get an audience it deserves or should so it's very it's, it's similar in that way in publishing in general you know what 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 things get published because it's a business venture and needs to sell copies and you know big five publishers merging and you know uh, that, that it all sounds, you know, quite similar to to what you're describing in the in the gaming world. Um, so you're probably dealing dealing with that on both both sides of uh, or, or two sides of your your creative endeavors. 
Well, I love I love making a living. I mean, they paid me, they they paid me well with with Neverloan and Foxtails, and and now with this this unnamed project or these unnamed projects, I'm that's how I'm making a living right now. And so when it comes with poetry, like it was it was uh, you know, um, Carla Blank, um, Ishmael Reed's wife, and also editor and uh, co-publisher of of the po poems I've I've published. Uh, the book of poetry said that if you um, if a book of poetry sells 500 copies it's a bestseller <laughs> so I'm, I'm a poetry bestseller and I'm so 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 proud of that like having sold more than 500 copies for my last book of poetry Rock Piles Along the Eddy and then I'm gonna um, we're, we're going to uh, reprint a couple hundred a couple hundred copies but you can't really make a living that way and, and the thing is, there are, there are internationally renowned poets who never sell 500 copies. You know what I mean? Like that's, you only get a handful every year who people sell in that range. That's how, that's how um, you know, that's how, how much of a dearth of um, public <laughs> interest and poetry is these days and it's 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 a sad 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 con condition in, in a lot of ways um on the other hand uh you know like there was an article in the new yorker that uh, you know where it talked about how um, i forget the writer but it, it, they talked about how you know no one pays attention po to poetry in a lot of ways that's good for the art <laughs> you know because poets do whatever they want really you know they could they could experiment all that they want and only a few of their other poets probably will, and and their family basically <laughs> and and some people in the community basically are going to pay attention you know and and so that that's how that's you know um on the other hand it would be that it'd be great if people paid more attention to poetry you know um and uh, you know that, that's what, why I was suggesting earlier. We are in a literate world, but not a literary world. There's a lot of pretensions to how, you know, advanced this, uh, the modern world is. And it, it's not, it's not, it's not evolved or advanced. It's no, no way. And, you know, any European culture, any, any indigenous culture, you know, indigenous cultures now and European cultures a few hundred years ago, um, and any industrial culture a few hundred years ago, were, and in cases of indigenous, are um, advanced in terms of a literary intellectual world. We're not in a literary or, or intellectual environment. But the thing is, with growing things like Never Alone, you know, um, where it's not in intellectual in a dry sense, you know. Um, and again, it tips you off to how, you know, when I talk about intellectual, I always have to like couch it. I always have to like defend it and protect it <laughs> because of how anti-intellectual this world is, you know. But like when, when there's a joy and there's a feeling of meaning and richness and vitality and fun, fun, you know, and even the entertainment value. You know, Arthurian legend is freaking beautiful. You know? Yeah, I mean, that, that was kind of what was exciting about the this content in a gaming platform was the potential for um, the experience um, and and the reach. You know, this this. This, the gaming audience being larger than the than the poetry audience, um, but also the things that you can add to it, that um, you know from design. Obviously, books have design, but usually a, a two dimensional cover and um, some, maybe some things on the inside. But this sort of rich experience and atmosphere and and sound and voice um, really really brought together, and then the idea of it maybe reaching more people. Uh, than than a than a volume of poems or, or whatever. Um, I definitely was thinking about that while I was playing as as a writer and publisher and, and seller of books. Um, and it was just kind of a 
for me, it re reinvigorated the genre and the possibilities of, of the genre. Because um, I had a, I, I sometimes have negative feelings towards towards it for the same reasons. Watching my son make those noises and and have those postures and and have those conflicts. Um, it's always something we as parents kind of work with him on and struggle with, and it's not it's not a it's not a force that's adding all the time. It's a it's a force that's in conflict a lot of times, um, and this felt different, and so um, and that was that was exciting both for the content and for the experience. I think when it comes to uh, poetry and books in general, there's typography that can that can relate to this kind of thing as well. It, typography is is a design. It's 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 its own organic more than 500 year tradition and especially with original letter presses and, and the original typographers you know the original punch cutters the original uh, typeface designers they they created books that were works of art that 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 gave you that sense of the the richness and vitality of the human voice and and the human hand and what, what can be created in that way as letter presses, it's just literally, you know, um, pressing into the paper. It's making it three dimensional, you know. So it's and, and you, you know the feeling of the ink on that page, and you could still create that with digital, but digital can flatten everything out, you know. And and especially how, I mean, even we talk about the distinction between food and drug, like how. People want to make um, even books a drug, you know, uh, certain types of genres and ways of writing that, that gets uh, publicized, you know, and and the uh, New York Times bestseller industrial complex, I call it. <laughs> you go to any book conference, anyone who is the New York Times bestseller, that's suddenly the, you know, they're, they're the ones who, um, you know, get all the, the attention and, and <laughs> You know, um, and then they're bestowing their, you know, their wisdom upon the world. Kind of thing. But with with typography, it, it's a it's a design. It, there's there's an organic richness that that comes from it. You know, if things are very very well designed, you can you can feel. I, I like how you're saying refreshing. You you feel refreshed every time. You know, when reading a really good book that's really well typographically designed, and and I so that that kind of parallel is exactly along the lines of, of what um, I'd wanted to achieve and talk to the team constantly and worked with them constantly about is is feeling like somehow through the design, through the human voice that you hear, through the words that you read, through the things that you watch. And, and, and the mechanics and how all of it's conceived, that almost like you're feeling nutrients in your body. And I think there really is a chemical reaction. Just like how you get that same chemical reaction if it's designed in a certain way. You know, you're tensing your body, your, your adrenals, your lymph nodes are, are addicted to a certain kind of reaction. Your body's producing an adrenaline rush and a dopamine high. And you're addicted to that, you know. And then you could go through highs and lows. And 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 if, if you get, you know, I mean, kids should have like a, a break, like two weeks a month break from from games. You know, um, that are, especially games that are like that. You know, and and not to mention what it's going to do to your your joints and everything. I mean, I. I <laughs> I, I worry about how we, you know, the gaming generation is going to be and the binge watching generation is going to be as soon as they start aging, you know, which is starting to happen. You know, um, life expect expectancy going down and, and all kinds of stuff, you know, so it, I think you have to think of it entirely holistically. It's an art and how is your gaming experience going to go? And, and in the same way that, that I'm, I'm reflecting in terms of typography, you know, where it's just almost like 
oh, it's almost like the pages are breathing. Because if it's well designed, it has the golden proportion, it's got a, a typeface that is organic, comes from a, an ancient tradition um, or a 500 year old tradition. And, and the writing is of high quality. It puts you in a state of, you're, you're just a little more perceptive and I'd say maybe a little more alive. And your body has a certain type of reaction. You're not sleeping, you know, but similar to meditation where it, it's an awake form of revitalizing the mind, body, and spirit. You could do that through art or you can create an addiction. Yeah, there, there would seem to be a, a, a you know a need for this. Uh, and like you said, I think folks in, inherently want that. And, I, and if they're exposed to it, can tell the difference. I, I know I know I did. Um, um, oh, I just want to say the, the counterpoint of that is I really I, I see how how much my kids play games <laughs> and I, I respect, I, I admire how they, um, they solve puzzles and, you know, like, you know, my son, you know, is always into the, the Minecraft, especially, um, but he, he also learned how to um, solve Rubik's cubes just because he took that on, you know, because you have to, you have to figure out an algorithm to do it. So like, I see him, you know, um, he studied that, you know, so, so there's ways to translate those skills you can get out of gaming, you know, um, but it, it takes, I think, a lot of guidance, a lot of parenting, a lot of teaching from the teachers on the teacher side. They, they really have to be involved in and invested in that and can't just be separate from it, which I think is where a lot of the unhealthy um, behaviors can come from, both on the parent side and on, on the children's side. When I, and I think... I think some of that divide is, is, is because of the games that are popular. You know, it, it doesn't it doesn't make teachers or parents want to be involved. It's a, it's a thing that that kid is doing, but I feel like this game, a parent wanders in, sits down, asks some questions, has a conversation. Oh, why did you do it that way? Why did you switch to the fox? Who are you talking to? Who is, what is that, what is that, what is that? What is that being that's sparkling and you seem to have to talk to it to get the, 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 the currents to change, to help you? Um, you know, yeah. you can do that with other games, certainly. You're like, you know, why, why are you using that gun? Why, why, did, you, why did you pick up that thing? Um, but I, I think, um, you know, I think that divide has a lot to do with the, the the type of game you know you walk into the room and it's loud and, and intense and and the person playing it's not necessarily happy um and so you just you turn around and walk away and you have that conversation later hey maybe we take a break tomorrow um instead of wandering in seeing a polar bear or or a you know uh and and asking and asking questions and being it being inviting to those kinds of interactions Absolutely, I, I think um, the, there's there's a good medium ground. I think that could be found yeah. with all the guidance that I'm talking about, like, um, and and that type of conversation building or connection building was a part of the process from 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 the beginning. That's what I've talked with the team about, and that's also just the expertise that people like Sean Vesey um, and art director Dima, Dima Veryavka, producer Man, Matt Swanson, they, all, they were all um, fully in line with that. Like they wanted, they wanted that, that sense that it doesn't, they, they, they see it themselves. I think anyone involved in the gaming industry, any gamers really, can see how isolating it can make someone. I mean, there's, there's people who spend 18 hours a day, you know, playing games like kids and grown adults as well who, who were able to you know who have their living paid for you know like 18 hours a day like that, that that's the type of addiction it could create and so that with any addiction it isolates people 
you know, and so how, how to, to, to bring that back. So rather than isolating, bringing people together, you know, was hope. Like in Alaska, it has started those conversations, which are beautiful when you have that generational divide. And that's in many ways why, another reason why the elders embrace this, because they saw how it could create that, that connection again. You know, and, and it has, it has when young people play the game and then they are hearing from the elders about the thing, you know, something is, it brings up, oh yeah, that's, la, la, la. you know, they talk about the different, you know, aspects that come up as the game's played. Is there a, Megan, is there a, is there a mode in the game that allows you to connect remotely to others? Like, could, could you be playing the fox and I be playing the es uh, the the girl from here? I feel like Steam has something where it's like remote co-play. So like, okay. uh, I don't know. I'd have to send you an invite through Steam to play with me. I've never personally tried it, but like that could be a way to do co-op. That'd be cool. Mm -hmm. um, that kind, those kinds of connections and you know distant communities are, are interesting parts of the game um megan any other comments or questions that you noticed or or had yourself before we wrap up here uh, i think one question i had prepared and maybe you guys touched on it but i was trying this double focusing you're, you're, so you're worried about a giant rat <laughs> yeah it might have been yeah. double focusing but um, I know earlier you had said, like, you know, if you tell a story and you don't have somebody where that story originated from, it's like cultural appropriation. And we're in, I feel like we're in a time where people are trying to tell underrepresented stories. Like, if you just look at Disney and the, the movies that they put out recently. Um, so, like, as I wanted to ask if there were, like, any recommendations towards, like, designers or storytellers who wanted to, you know, try to give light to these stories but not want to be, like, culturally appropriating them is it is it reaching out to people to like and having them on the design team as we've talked about yeah yeah beth laponce who i mentioned earlier she's an ishinabe game dev and the one game i know about about that she, she made was thunderbird strike which is um a game where they a thunderbird um destroys the black snake representing oil which became political, and Beth has been attacked for that. But that, that's part of the myth, myth, mythology among a lot of the peoples in, um, we call it the lower 48, you know, American Indian communities, where there's a, a mythology of the black snake coming over the lands, and how um, elders have equated it to um, the oil pipelines. So that's very interesting. That and and that and a number of other games. She's, but that's the one that I, I know about. So Beth La Ponce uh, has is really, the, you know, um, she has pioneered native game development, and um, in a lot of ways, never alone getting so much of the attention. Like I should go more should go to Beth, for sure. And then there's um, Alan Turner. Uh, Lakota, game 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 designer, and the one game that I know about that he's created is Idrigor, where it's a tabletop game, and it's it it was made in response to Dungeons and Dragons, where Dungeons and Dragons I'm not I don't haven't played it, but as far as I can tell, and as Alan has talked about can have these moments where it's it's a lot about domination, trying to dominate others, you know, trying to overpower them, take over, you know, and so he wanted to conceive a game that's just as engaging as D&D, that is, but that somehow subverts or transcends that, that paradigm of dominating others, that colonial paradigm. And um, Rene Culp is another, um, game, you know, native game dev. And so, yeah, those are, those are the main, it, I think it's burgeoning native game um, development and Never Alone is one of those that, that shot up as far as attention um, to native games go. And, but I, I think there could be uh, so much more of that. 
and like John Romero, who's been in the industry and made all kinds of all kinds of games, you know, um, and hasn't really played up his his native side, but yet it it's reflected in how he has created, you know, even though that's a first person shooter. I mean, you you we are critiquing that, you know, in a lot of ways, but there's also something to that you know, that world mechanically, you know, um, opening up that, that he's done that's indigenous, you know, so it's not a cut and dry kind of kind of line. And, you know, I, I, I think that the, the outreach is, is going well. I mean, that's, that's partly how I'm, I'm getting these opportunities, you know, I mean, that it should, for me, it's like, you have to be tw two or three times as good, you know, in order to you know, um, get any attention or, or notice. So it's not like affirmative, like a, a sort of a, I mean, affirmative action should, I mean, politically, I mean, I think that that's a good, a good thing, but it's, it's not like, like throwing us a bone, you know, uh, that's what I'm trying to say. It's not like throwing me a bone to, for me to get these opportunities. I, I've had to prove myself over and over and over again and, and find and wait until the moment comes where people are like, oh, well, let's uh, pay attention to the other people, <laughs> you know? And so it, there, it, it's, it's beyond this paradigm of um, uh, more developed people. And, and then, you know, they, they give other people, they bestow the opportunity upon others, you know, um, that kind of thing. It's, it's more like, you know, there's finally um, the economics for this. You know the attention paid on that on on, on different peoples so i, I think there's just got to be way 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 more of it because of quality you know um excellence you know ability there's got to be this kind of outreach okay yeah thank you that sounds, sounds great it's just you know, connecting with people on like a human level, like everybody wants, you know? Yeah, and then, you know, and then there's, um, you know, more game, uh, Reservation Dogs, that's a TV show. I haven't, I haven't caught it yet, but um, Sterling Harjo is a uh, native filmmaker, you know, getting that out, you know, so there's, there's native film and, and TV um, that's that's being developed, and and I think again the model of what Black Panther has done is super super cool. Like things like that, August Wilson in theater, and and the movies by August Wilson, you know, adapted from August Wilson plays, are are are, are really amazing. And I think, you know, August Wilson gave a gave a speech to the theater uh, theater conference. Um, TCG Theater Communications Group called The Ground on Which I Stand. And he made a very, very direct point about how we should be, he was saying how he should, they should, the black community should be making theater for and by us, by them. And Producer, producing, creating the business models, and having the audience coming from and for Black people, and and having that be through and through, you know. So I think there's a value to that. Like if you just center within these the peoples themselves, it doesn't actually create isolation, you know. Which there, there's an int intimidation factor to that sort of. Um, framework it doesn't actually create is isolation or opposition it, it creates excellence you know um if you go if you go by that model and so i'm i'm willing to work with you know like the eline media uh, um, group they're they're not they're not native um these other video game companies i'm, I'm working with are not native on the other hand there's beth la Ponce, who is making native games through and through, you know, um, producing independently. And an August Wilson model and also my, my namesake, Ishmael Reed. You know, um, you don't need to go to these, these bigger companies 
Um, you could do it yourself, you know. On the other hand, I'm okay working with these vegan companies <laughs> as long as, you know, they'll listen to me. They'll respect what I have to say. And uh, thankfully, I'm, I'm, I'm out, outspoken enough uh, that I get the point across, <laughs> you know, and, and, and make it happen, you know. I, I make it happen. I know, I know who I'm representing. I, and that's what I tell people. I have to go back to these people. I'm going back to these community, this community. I have to answer to them. I see them every day. I have to talk to these elders. If I'm taking advantage of them, if I'm misrepresenting them, if I'm showing something disrespectful through their eyes, I'm gonna face the consequences really, really uh, harshly. <laughs> you know, and even if I do a good job, I mean, especially with, I think, the Clinket community. Uh, it's, just, it's just how it is. Even if I do a good job, I, I, I still, you know, people give me a hard time. <laughs> so, on the other hand, there's a lot of great stuff. I mean, having these kind of opportunities are amazing. Yeah, thanks so much for, for being with us and talking us through the background of the game and the making of the game and all that, that process. Um, yeah. Thanks for thanks for playing, Megan. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for yeah. Again, thank you for talking with us. Really appreciated hearing everything you had to say. Um, really love the game. It's just a lot of fun. Uh, hope the viewers. I think the viewers really liked it as well. They had they very much enjoyed the conversation and then having well seeing what the game was like in the story and the background. Right on. Thank you. Yeah. Kleana, Kleana pa, diof, ulchish. That's thank you in my languages. Play, play, the whole word is thank you. Play in a va. Oh, no, I was saying play in a va. Thank you very much. Oh. In a new back. Okay. Dioch is in Welsh. Oh. Machish is in Clinket. Oh. Whole lot yeah. of thank yous. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, thank you guys so much for watching today. Uh, we're going to end the stream now. But. I don't know. Uh, I think in a month's time, uh, I think it's November 12th, we will have another Global Change Series event. It is uh, going to be a Beyond Blue game in that time, and we will have another guest speaker, but I don't I don't know who it is off the top of my head. But thank you, chat, so much for watching. Uh, thank you, Chris and Ishmael, for joining me today. And everybody have a lovely weekend. Bye-bye. Thanks, y'all.